Yeah, maybe do some research. Uh, Peter. Thank you. That's the only started on Marx and Chandler, the uh, alphabet of uh, visualization. Before we start, are there any questions about the homework, for example, or any other organizational things? Everybody is doing fine? Great. Cool. So, um, so what, what we kind of stopped last time was we had Basic, uh, we, we distinguished between, like we had D3 selections and we uh, talked about mapping the data, how do we handle elements that are added, that are removed, or that are updated. And so I'm gonna like, recap quickly what we talked about um, selections and binding data. So by using the select all D3 command, uh, we can select on any um, element or on any class or on any identifier. Um, we can also use any of these parent selections and so on. So anything that you could use in C for CSS selections, you could use in this uh, D3 select or select all uh, function. Like remember the difference between select is only that the first element matches. So here, for example, a select on the SVG is fine because there's only a single SVG. Uh, but for example, we have multiple rectangles here. Um, and so we do a select all. And then uh, on the selection, so what this does is creates a data structure um, of these DOM objects. Um, and then, the, like an array of these DOM objects, and then here the data command binds uh, the data to these DOM objects. So we have now the three rectangles that are in this SVG now have a data field associated with them of 127, 61, and 256. Um, and then within the three, what, like, we have these chained uh, methods. So like data here, again, returns an array of these DOM elements. An attribute applies something, but again, returns the array of the DOM elements, and so on. But by doing that, we have this nice function of method chaining, so I don't have to do svg.data, svg.attribute, or rects.addata, rects.attribute, rects.attribute, and so on. So I can do this like simple chaining. And then all of these functions, if I, if I, like, many of these functions take uh, either like an explicit ver um, value or also like a function, uh, like an anonymous function where I evaluate some expression and then return uh, the, the, the whatever I care about. 
So, and, and these anonymous functions, they then always have two parameters, the data parameter and the index parameter. By convention, they're called D and I, but of course only the order here matters. Um, and so in this case, we are only using the index, like the position of the DOM element in this, uh, in this array. Um, in this case, we are only using the data. And so this is where we do the data-driven styling. We um, here set a width of 127 in the first case, of 61 in the second case, of 256 in the second case, and the third case. So this is the basic uh, idea. Um, and then if I apply that, if I run that function, like I remember, this is this execute function that is being called when I click on the run button, um, then I get a bar chart like this. So then we talked about what happens if we have more elements than we have, uh, uh, when, we, when we have more data elements than we have SVG elements on the canvas. And by, if we don't take special care of that, we can see that the fourth um, element in the, in the data array here is simply not drawn. And so how can we take care of that? Well, we have to separate this out into the enter selection. So here we're treating, I'm sorry. Um, here we are treating uh, the, the update selection, and then down here uh, we are uh, treating the enter selection. Right? And you can think of this as like uh, a set. So here we have all the elements, let's say, um, these are all the elements in the, in the data, and these are all the elements that we have on the SVG. Data, and our, let's say selection. Okay. So here are the elements where we have both data and selections. So that if you have three data elements and three rectangles on the screen, this is exactly this intersection and we don't really have to properly, uh, like we don't have to uh, explicitly treat an enter and update, and this, uh, an enter or an exit. So this is essentially the update selection. This here are the elements that where we have data items, but not a, a matching element in the selection. So this here is the enter selection. Okay, and so this is what we're, what we're doing here. We're separating out uh, the enter, like this corresponds to the set of elements that where we have data, but don't have a matching element in the selection. And then finally we have the exit selection here. These are the elements where we don't have data but have elements in our selection. So if I had, let's say, five rectangles in my SVG but only three elements in my data set, then I would have two elements in here. And so these three uh, selections are what I have to treat separately, and this is what we're doing here. Is there ever enter and exit? Yes, okay. certainly. Um, so um, we're, for example, right now assuming that like, we don't care about which rectangle is which one, but like, next time I will, we'll learn about how we can give each of these rectangles, for example, a specific unique ID. Um, and so we could have, like, let's say, additional companies come in in the chart and some of them dropping out. So it's, it's very possible that you have all three of them. Okay. Um, so here we're treating the enter selection separately uh, by simply appending rectangles, but we're not applying the styling. And so what we see here is that we get the new element, uh, but it is not properly drawn. And if we run this again, this is going to work fine because we already had uh, the element in the SVG, and so therefore the element in the uh, selection. Um, so this is a way of fixing this problem. Here I'm simply copying most of this code here. This code here is copied down here, and so it's applied twice with exactly the same configuration, with the one exception that the new elements in the enter selection are green, the old elements are blue. Um, this does work, of course, but it is not very elegant because I'm duplicating the code. And so the better way of doing that is by doing this piece here. Um, enter, append rectangles and merge selections. So what is going on here? Uh, we take um, we, we retrieve the selection, we select all rectangles and bound the data to it. So here we, we take the enter selection, we, in these enter selection elements, these are DOM elements that are not properly initialized. And by calling append rectangle, we make them to be SVG rectangles. Um, and then by calling dot merge selection, what we do is we now merge the update selection with the enter selection so that we are operating on this circle here. 
And this is the important part. Like we have like t taken the uninitialized elements of the entry selection, um, appended rectangles to them, therefore made them initialized. Now we have these rectangles um, that are associated with data, um, and then we merge them with the update selection. And then I can apply anything that I want to do to those rectangles in one single place down here. And then this works smoothly as I would expect. Um, so the same thing is of course true if I don't have any SVG elements. So here, like you can see the SVG here is empty. Um, I'm using three data elements. Um, and in this case, I'm actually not doing it. Uh, I'm doing the enter here. Um, I'm not doing the merge just for, the, for brevity. But in practice, you would probably want to do the merge. So this does work fine. Um, and so now what happens when we have more SVG elements than uh, we have um, elements in the data set. So here we have only two elements in the data set. Uh, if we run this, we have this one leftover element because we're not treating this exit selection here. So this is not properly treated. Um, and we can treat that by simply uh, adding a very simple line down here, selection.exit.remove. And so by dot exit, we retrieve the elements that were not be that, that uh, were uh, the three couldn't match a data element to uh, any of the elements in the selection, and then we remove them. And so now if we do that, we see that this third element is properly removed. So this is how far we got last time. Uh, this is like the fundamentals, and I hope that is clear. So if you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Great. So. Like this is just a very basic, and if you get that, and if you reliably get that and understand that, then you will have not a, you won't have a hard time uh, doing the homework. Um, so here is now like some of the magic of D3. Um, so we can do things like these gen dynamic transitions um, very easily. And so what happens in such a dynamic transition? Right, we have a an interpolation between a previous state um, and a current state. So we st we this is initialized with this like gray boxes, um, and then we want to run a linear or any kind of interpolation, if linear or nonlinear, um, for both, for many different attributes. So we're actually interpolating here position, we're interpolating the size of these rectangles, and we're interpolating the color. So all of these visual attributes are dynamically inter interpolated here. And I actually did write that myself before D3 existed in uh, OpenGL, and it took me like a week and a half or so to implement this properly. Now it's one single line of code, uh, and it just works. Um, so what, is, what are we doing here? Uh, all we need to do is call transition and then set a duration. So here, select all data and then apply transition, set duration to 3 seconds, 3,000 milliseconds, and then simply keep doing our styling. And so this is then, we can see this is a three second um, thing here. If I reduce the time to one second, you will see that this is quite a lot faster. So this is all fine. Now we need to combine this again, this again with the enter. So here I have three elements, four elements in the rectangle. Um, I'm appending a rectangle. I'm appending the rectangle as red and in a static position and of a static size. Here I'm handling the exit selection by uh, fading the element out. So like the, like this, for axis selections, it's quite often quite a good idea to simply fade them in the background and then remove them. And so here I'm setting attribute opacity, like this is completely opaque. Then I'm starting the transition, set the duration to three seconds, uh, set the attribute opacity after the transition to zero. So this is kind of the end state of our interpolation. And then once this is done, I'm removing the elements from the DOM. Because if I just set them to opa opaque, uh, but not remove them, they would still be sticking around in the DOM, would just not be visible. Um, here we're merging the updated selections with the original selections, so that we have this like circle that represents the data here. Um, and then uh, for the update, we do some like simple transition uh, for over three seconds. Um, and then what we do down here is we start a second transition. So once this is completed, we start another transition uh, for uh, three seconds, but we delay it for three seconds, and then we fill it to green, and then increase, increase the width. So, okay, maybe let's look at this, what this all does. The red rectangle appears, it's moved over there, we're waiting for three seconds, things turn green and start to grow. Um, and all of this is very simple to do, right? So we have 
simple, like uh, here's a transition definition, here's a, a, a delay, and then we modify the styling parameter. Okay, um, so you've all seen this um, SVG path element, and so what we could do is we could simply like do this by hand. We would, we would call um, SVG append path and then define uh, the attribute the way we have learned it in the SVG lecture and the way you've used it in your homework with, with all these like um, move the pointer, then draw a line, then draw a line and so on. Um, so this works fine, but this can be of course a little bit inconvenient because uh, these values here, they're like we want to draw these line charts in a data driven way as well. And to do that, um, here is a simple example of, of how we can do that. So you will see that the result here is the same thing. Uh, we just take a little bit more structured approach here. So here we have points that have an x and a y value, um, the x-axis and the y-axis, and we, we store them in an array uh, of points with uh, an, an array of objects where we have x and y fields. And then we use the d3line function. And the d3line function, we simply say, like, for, like we define for the line multiple x and y positions. Um, and so this is very simple. We simply say dot x um, is the, uh, the data point dot x dot y is the data point dot y. So this refers to, like we're assuming that we get an object of this type here with x and y and then returning those values. Of course, these could be arbitrary names, right? And so I could refer to them here. It's just convenient that they're all the code x and y. Um, and then we uh, simply call, like here, uh, we simply call the line function with the points as the path attribute. So this line function takes in the data array that we, or the data array that we give it here, uh, converts that into the path element, and then uh, applies that. So this is simply, this generates this path element for us, for us, and we don't have to think at all about uh, how the SVG path element works in practice. So we can see that this is the result here. Um, and we can also try out a couple of different um, interpolation techniques. So we have seen last time that we can do curves, for example. Um, and so by simply changing that a, a little bit, we can get, um, in this case, I think we're using a cut normal curve, or we could use a curve. Uh, and then we can actually also change the bundling strength of this curve. So uh, these are the kind of variations that you can do. Um, of course, like what is sensible for your design um, can, can vary a lot. Okay, so this was kind of like the wrap up for the D3 lecture that I couldn't finish up last time. Uh, any questions about D3 before I move on to like theory lecture again? <coughs> okay, great. So in your next homework that will be released uh, today or tomorrow, you guys will be uh, creating a couple of bar charts using the D3 um, API, but also the standard DOM API, which we'll be talking about on Tuesday. Um, and there will be some interactivity, so we'll be switching through data sets, and so you'll have to do proper enter updates and exits and so on. Great. So next, um, I wanted to quickly review uh, what we talked about data set types. Um, so we distinguish between these data set types, tables, networks, fields, and geometry, and we discuss them in, in some detail. Uh, I emphasize the value or the importance of the semantics. Only if we understand what things mean can we actually make sense of a specific cell or specific data items. So we need to understand the real world meaning. Um, then we uh, distinguish between items and attributes, where items are these individual discrete entities such as patients, cars, stocks, cities, which are called independent variables, and attributes would be these measured, observed, or locked properties such as the height of the patient, the blood pressure of the patients, or the horsepower of a car, or the make of a car, which are commonly called the dependent variables. So here, like these, the people would be the items, and then we would have the attributes um, these observed elements would be name, age, shirt size, and favorite fruit. For tables, we distinguish between flat tables and multidimensional tables. For flat tables, we have one item per row, um, and each column is an attribute. Um, so this is kind of like what we've seen before. Uh, here, the item, um, and then each column being the attribute. We have a unique key that can also be implicit, just the position of the row, but there is always 
uh, some kind of key in a flat table. And then we can also have multi-dimensional uh, tables uh, where we have um, indexing based on multiple keys. So we had this example of the genes of multiple patients uh, last time. Okay. Uh, we talked about graphs uh, or networks um, and then we talked about like we'll talk more about graphs when we talk about graph visualization. Then we talked about different fields, uh, for, and especially for about these grid types, how these fields are sampled. Remember, the fields are these continuous uh, data sources, and we have to somehow um, sample them. We have uniform grids, we had rectilinear grids, we had structured grids, and we had unstructured grids. Um, we talked about geometry, which kind of defines the shape of the items by using explicit spatial positions. Um, which are not really a core visualization topic, but we'll be encountering them when we deal with maps. And then we had other collections such as sets, lists, and clusters. Uh, then we talk more about the attribute types, and here there's a couple of important distinctions. So there's the unordered categorical data, which is also called nominal data, where you only can compare equality. So there is no difference, or there's no orderable difference between apple or, or pears or peaches. Uh, or there is no orderable difference between a horror movie and a drama movie. Um, there is, however, uh, like categorical ordered data types, such as, for example, shirt sizes. So these are not, like, I can't say, like, a large shirt is twice as big um, as a medium shirt, but I can make, uh, I can make, a, I can order them, I can make any uh, assumptions about their ordering. Um, and then we talked about quantitative measures, uh, where I can do ar arithmetic, things like length, weight, and count. And then we distinguished interval types from ratio types, and the main difference here was, does zero have a meaning? Is zero equal to none? Um, and if you actually have a meaningful zero, then you have a uh, quantitative ratio type, and if you don't have a well-defined zero, such as, for example, in temperature, or the, uh, a year, um, then you um, have uh, an interval uh, quantitative data type. And so this is kind of like this table that sums this up. We have nominal data type, the nominal data type that only allows us to, to, to evaluate equality or inequality. Um, for ordinal data, we can also um, define the order. For interval data, we can do additions and subtractions. And for ratio data, we can also do uh, multiplications and divisions and express proportions. So then we stop with this quiz, and I think we didn't get to this point. This is kind of like in the first new slide. Um, we talked about, or we didn't talk about them. Let's think about sequential data. There is um, sequential data is homogeneous from a minimum to a maximum. So, for example, the number of people in a country, right? There's, there's um, like there, there could be a country with zero people in there, um, but the, the country, like every country, has like a number of people in them. If we have a like, there's no country with minus people. Like, there's no uh, negative number of people that you can't count negatively, right? Um, for diverging data sets, you have essentially two or multiple sequences that meet at some kind of inflection point. So, for example, uh, and a good example is an elevation data set where I have elevation above sea level and elevation below sea level, so where there is water. And so here is a color scale um, that prop like appropriately. Um, visualizes this elevation data set but does not account uh, that we have a meaningful zero here. So this, this is a diverging data set. So this goes to minus 3,500 feet, uh, from minus 3,500 feet to plus 1,000 feet, but it doesn't take special care of this neutral point of zero here. And if we have a color scale that does take care of that appropriately, we can actually make sense of this picture. So that's just a very simple example of why this is important. Um, there can, of course, be other structure in your data set. So a good example here is cyclic, uh, cyclic data. We, we like, human life happens in cycles, right? We have days, we have weeks, we have months, we have years. Um, and these cycles often have observable patterns. And if we leverage those cycles, the knowledge about those cycles, we can see interesting things in the data set. So here, for example, on the left, this is a data set about respi respiratory disease cases. And on the left, this is a 25-day pattern, um, and you can't really spot a clear pattern. But if you change the cycle here to 28 days, you can see a very clear weekly pattern. So like, 
uh, people go to the doctor for their respiratory cases usually on Mondays. So they don't usually go to the doctor on the weekends because the doctor is closed because they can probably don't have to go to work anyways. Um, so uh, these kinds of patterns, they, they are very observable. And then these patterns, they can also happen on multiple levels. So here is like a, a Google Analytics plot of, a, of um, uh, the, this course website from a couple of years ago. Um, and you could see that here in the summer, July, October, essentially nobody really looked at this class and then the class started in January and you can see uh, on this course aggregation level, okay, around here uh, was like a big spike. Um, this was where like this, the course website was actually in some newsletter and so on and so that kept going. Um, so this is the global trend that we see at this resolution. If we have like, if we break this down to a daily use, we can very clearly see here the weekend. So this is like Monday to Friday, then Saturday to Sunday. Monday to Friday, Sunday to Sunday. This is the same time range. This is this peak here, but we simply cannot observe it um, in this aggregated resolution. So how you aggregate the data uh, depends a lot on what you want to show about the data, and you always have to be aware of these uh, structures. Okay, so here, uh, just an example to reiterate what, what we had in this lecture. Here is the, this is the item of the table. This is a table of product orders. Like we have an order ID, order date, order priority, the product container, product base margin, and the ship date. So this would be the item or the element or the independent variable. This here would be an example of an attribute which is also called often a dimension or a dependent variable or sometimes also called a feature. Um, here we have the definition of the semantics. What, does, what do those things actually mean? Uh, where are the keys here? Okay. Who thinks it's the order ID? You guys are wrong. <laughs> uh, the order ID is not unique. Um, so in this table we have like one order can contain multiple items. Um, but this is a, a table of items. So where could the keys be here? The first, column. The first column would be? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> the row number, yes. So this is an implicit key here. So it is the row number. Uh, it's not the order ID. Uh, what are the attribute types? Like, is it nominal, is it categorical, is it ratio or interval? So what is the order ID? What's the attribute of order ID? Order. What's that? Order. Order ordinal? Ordered? Are you saying ordered or yes? <laughs> Anybody have a different opinion? It's yeah, so you could make an argument that it could be ordered. But you could also say it, it, the, the number really doesn't matter, right? It could be a unique key. Uh, I wouldn't want to infer an order by that. What is the order date? Interval. Yeah, that's correct. What's order priority? Ordinal, yes. Uh, product container. Categorical here, any other opinions? So you could make an argument that it's either categorical or ordinal, right? Depending on how you think about it. The product base margin. Ratio, Ratio correct. Now ship date is an order date. So here is just a distinction between like not interval ratio, just categorical, ordinal, quantitative. Um, so here like yeah, this is kind of like debatable whether categorical or ordinal, um, and these are, I would say, ordinal, but could also be categorical. Okay. Um, so then I also wanted to emphasize this difference between uh, like a data model and a conceptual model. The data model is a low level description of the data um, where we like, also have uh, operations defined. So uh, fl floats, for example, with additions, subtractions, divisions, and multiplications. Whereas the conceptual model is really 
more about the mental construction that we try to infer on a data set. So here this includes semantics and support reasoning. So for example, um, the data model here would be like 1D floats and the conceptual model behind it could be temperature. Or the data model would be a 3D vector of floats, the conceptual model here could be space. So this distinction between like how it is stored and what does it mean is very important. So from the data model, so for example here we would have to uh, we would have a, a, a series of numbers like 32.5, 54, minus 17 are being floats. Um, we can make sense of these values by using the conceptual model that these are temperatures um, to a specific data type. So we could define our data type to be quantitative, continuous to four significant digits, or we could bin it into multiple categories as hot, warm, or cold to be an ordinal data set, or we could make, like, we could infer from that like a nominal distinction between burn versus not burn. So what we collect in the data, uh, we have to bring in semantics and reasoning about that, and then we very often have to transfer it um, to a data type that makes sense for a specific application. So, um, right now we have thought about those things in these isolated cell silos. It was either a graph or a table or a set or a cluster or something like that. Um, but in practice, um, these co combinations are very com com uh, common. So networks or graphs of people, for example, have attributes. Like every person in your social network has an age, an occupation, uh, and other things. So there is both a topology uh, and attributes about those nodes relevant. Attributes have hierarchies, so I can break down attributes into bigger classes of attributes. Data types can be transformed. And so kind of like the, the point of this slide is really just, just to say that these are sensible abstractions to think about in, in uh, uh, for conceptually, but in real life we have very often combinations for meaningful visualization problems. So real life is complicated. So that concludes the wrap up for the data lecture and now I want to continue with the Marks and Channel lecture. Okay, so let's do another little exercise. How can I visually represent two numbers, let's say four and eight? You'll be shouting out solutions and I'll be drawing. How can I show graphically two numbers, four and eight? Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes? Four sticks, like yes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A bar chart, yeah. I could have something like this, and then something like this, about twice the height. Number line. How many number line? Uh, number line. Number line. Yeah. Like this. Um, so what 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 are we using here? Time. Position. Like this is essentially we have. A reference point, and then we have position at four, position at eight. Yeah? Area. That's correct, area. I could have like bubbles like that. Other ideas? Two arrows of different lengths. Two arrows of different length, yeah, which is related to the bar charts, right? A pie chart, maybe 12 parts. A pie chart? 12 parts, 12 parts, maybe 12 parts. Um, yeah, so something like, okay, how is my like 12? It's like a third roughly, right? Something like that? Other ideas? Right now I'm only using a black pen. I have blue and red. Anybody? Suggestions? Okay, nobody wants to say color. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes? We can have four bubbles and eight bubbles. Yeah, which is kind of related to this up okay. here, right? We have kind of some, some explicit counting, some isotype. So we could have like one, two, 
three, four, versus one, two, three, four, and then we could also do some smart grouping. So we see this is kind of like a um, duplication. Yeah. Angle is by ratio. Angle. Angle. Yes, we can use angle four versus eight. eight. We could also. It's hard to draw. Do like value. I'm just gonna do shading here versus something which is much more shaded. So this could be either texture or value or saturation. Uh, but clearly color is not a good idea for quantitative values. Any other ideas? I can use curvature, things like but of course these get increasingly esoteric. Um, so, like, let's think about this in a bit, a bit of a more structured way. Um, when we talk about the visualization alphabet, we distinguish between marks and channels. The mark here represents an item or the links. So, like, each row in a table is represented by a mark. And then the channel, they change the appearance proportionally to an attribute or based on an attribute. So, for example, if we have item person and height, uh, and the person's height is, is what we care about, the attribute, um, then we would use, like for example, a glyph of a rectangle as the mark and the height of the rectangle uh, as the channel. And, we, uh, um, and so this is like how we create uh, these visual variables. Um, also note that in the literature you will find the words channels and visual variables used interchangeably. I also use them interchangeably. I'll try to use channel, but I've also used visual variable a lot. So. These two things mean the same thing. So what are the marks for items? It could be like basic geometric elements, such as points or lines or areas. So here we have like, uh, the marks here are these dashes, the marks here are the circles, the marks here are the rectangles, these areas, or here it's these points. Um, it could also be like a line chart, for example, in some way. For um, 3D, you could also, like a 3D mark could also be a volume, but in practice this is rarely used. Uh, marks for links show, like we talked about that, those in, when we talked about Gestalt principles, this is a little bit hard to see, but here is like a, an enclosure. Um, here we have an explicit connection, and here are some couple of other examples. So these are the marks that we use for the links. Um, and then we can also use nested containment. Uh, so here is an example for um, a Euler diagram where we have like a multi-level nested containment. So this person, Sophia here, belongs to this dark orange group, the light orange group, the pink group, the uh, other pink group, violet group, pink group, and to the blue group, for example. Um, and then we have this, these vocabulary of channels or visual variables. They control the appearance proportional or based on an attribute. And these are the ones that we came up with here. Things like position on um, like the number scale, or uh, color, or shape, or tilt, or the length, or the area, or the volume. And of course, not all of them are equal. Uh, and this kind of like systematically, well, the systematic approach to this goes back to Jacques Cartin, who was a French cartographer who passed away in 2010. Um, he wrote this very, very influential book, Semiology of Graphics, that for the first time, like, Came to a structured approach uh, to these visual variables, to these um, channels and marks. Um, and so he developed these theoretical principles and also provided the ranking of them. And so this is what he came up with. Here we have the marks, points, lines, and areas. And then we have position, size, the gray value, texture, color, orientation, and shape. Um, and so we have since like, done very detailed studies as you, like if you've read, read the paper, as you've seen, to understand which of these marks and channels is sensible in which situations. Okay, so here's an example of using marks and channels. Here in the first one here, we have a, the mark being the line or the rectangle. Uh, the channel here is the length and the position. And what we're encoding here is one quantitative attribute and one categorical attribute. So the quantitative attribute is the magnitude, the categorical attribute here could also be the item, but could be something like um, Asia, Europe, uh, and Africa um, on this chart here. 
if we use as a mark a point and then channel position, we can encode two quantitative attributes and we get something like the scatter plots. And we can see the relationship between these uh, quantitative attributes very well. If we then want to use um, an additional categorical attribute, for example, to again encode the continents that we had here, we can add, for example, hue. And then we have, like, we can distinguish here, let's say, the European uh, values from the African values. And then if we add another one, for example, to encode a third quantitative attribute, we could use size. And so like that, I could, in theory, keep combining these attributes and create these increasingly complex representations Anybody can see a problem with that? Like if I, what happens now if I add, let's say, volume or shading or anything like that here uh, to include more information? So these things are not independent, right? Like um, there is interactions between them. For example, if I have very, very small dots, I can't really see uh, the color anymore. I'll have a better example for that later. Um, we can also use redundant encoding. So here, I'm actually using three different encodings just to show one particular value. I'm using length, position, and value. So length is used by simply like plotting these, char these bars at different lengths. Position is essentially used by like look at the position of the upper edge relative to the lower edge, which is a line here. And then the value of these bars also represents this data. So here I have a threefold redundant encoding. Uh, which is, can be uh, very powerful, can also be problematic. So what's wrong with this bar chart? <laughs> this was like the Snowmageddon season in Boston. Uh, they had this interesting bar chart where before January 23 they had 5.5 inches and then after January 23 they had 71 inches. So what's wrong here? Just this is absolutely not proportional, right? There is completely different scales for those bar charts, and I actually don't get the point here because usually newspaper or news organizations try to like make something more dramatic, but here they're actually <laughs> making it less dramatic, right? It looks like oh, we only get like an extra twenty percent of snow, but in fact it's like many times as much snow. So I don't really understand what is going on here. So. The one rule is to use the channel proportional to the data, which is kind of obvious, but you would be surprised. Um, so we distinguish two different types of channels. These magnitude channels, they, they, we can use them for ordinal and quantitative data. They, can us, they let us express quantities, how much, um, and the good examples are position, length, and saturations. And then we have identity channels that simply allow us to um, keep items apart, but cannot um, convey the numerical values. Um, and so what these are, are for example shape, color, or also spatial region. And this is applied for categorical data. Um, and this is like from our textbook that we used by Tamara Manzner. This is this like order table um, ranked these various channels for magnitude and for identities ranked by effectiveness. And this is, of course, based on studies such as the one we've just read uh, to come up with those rankings. So position on a common scale is the most powerful scale, uh, the most powerful channel uh, for um, quantitative for magnitude channels. Position on an underlined scale is the second most powerful. Length is the third most powerful. Then we have tilt, angle, area to D size, the 3D position, color luminance, color saturation, curvature, and volume. For the identity channels, again, spatial region is very important. Um, so we can separate things out. For example, everything of type A is on this side, everything of type B is on this side. Um, but we can also use color hue, we can use motion, uh, or we can use shape. Um, you basically see that there's a lot less options for categorical attributes. Um, so. Um, you kind of have to be a little bit careful about how to pick those. So in this example here, uh, we, this is a New York Times visualization where we see um, the tax rates of various companies in the United States. So what are the visual variables, that, the marks and channels that are used here? Color. Color? What does color encode? Please raise your hands. Color encodes? 
the value, um, well, can I be more specific? Uh, the effective tax rate. Exactly. So color encodes the effective tax rate, but can you distinguish be between an effective ta tax rate of 3 and 5 percent by value? No. So color is here is used in a binned way. So there's a couple of bins, and it's basically, um, they kind of like give us a hint of the overall average here is 29 percent. Um, and so they give us like a hint of below average and above average. Which other marks and channels are used here? Like what is the mark? What are, how are the companies encoded? Uh, yeah, not, well, not, now I'm looking for the mark, not a channel. It's just the circles, yes. So that's the mark. Companies are encoded by circles. And then the, the attributes of these companies, so for example the tax rate, is um, varied by what? We already had color, and which other attributes do we have? Size. Size, yes. And the size essentially t tells us the market capitalization, how big those companies are. And we can see that there's a couple of really big companies. Here's Apple, and here, let's say, this is Citigroup, this is Exxon, and so on. What else? What, is the, what other uh, channel is being used here? Location, yes, uh, that's also a position. Um, and can you be more specific? Exactly, so we have an X position uh, on an X axis. Do you think the Y position is meaningful? No. Not really, yeah. It's, it's, there is kind of like, it, this is basically, even, I'm, I'm even doubtful that the X position is precise uh, because this is probably some force based layout. Here, so that we get, you should get a rough idea of where, where things are, but I'm sure that, the, that this is not completely precise, like two multiple digits. Um, so the Y position here is kind of like more of a function of how many other companies of which size are in the same area. It doesn't tell us too much. Well, I guess it tells us that the majority of the market is somewhere in this uh, area. Okay, and then if I click on this button here, um, now I'm separating it out by industries. And so what am I using here now? What channel? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, so we are using we were separating it out by industry and how are we doing that? By Y location. So here we're using a categorical variable encoded by spatial region. So we say the utilities here are in this area, the information technology companies are in this area, the industries are in this area. So we're using like, uh, the categorical information, which type of industry is it, and plot that by spatial position, and then we use the actual tax rate also by spatial position. So this is a very effective chart. They use the most important uh, pieces of information uh, they convey them with the most powerful channels. And I think they're doing a pretty good, good job with this particular chart here. Um, interesting to see is also like who's paying the lowest taxes, utilities, and the big IT companies. Like Apple is one of the uh, like companies that barely pays any taxes. And if you look at the high tax uh, areas, this is insurances and energy. Like Exxon, for example, pays about 37%. And that, of course, means something if an economy like the economy of the United States moves more and more into this area of information technology and those companies are lowly taxed. Of course, this has implications for a nation's uh, tax base. Okay, so, great. So let's, let's think a little bit more formally about the characteristics of these channels. Um, so what, are, what can we say about those channels? We can say, um, are they selective? Can we easily distinguish um, marks um, from each other? So for example, if there's only a slight variation, if we use a specific, um, um, a specific channel, can we actually tell the difference? Um, are they associative? Does it support grouping? Uh, for example, if we have similar elements, can we um, perceive them similarly? So for example, here position clearly supports grouping. We have D3 elements that are similar, to, and then D3 elements that are similar. Um, and then, uh, are they quantitative? Can we quantify the difference between two marks easily? So like this here is about twice as big as this here. 
Um, can we order them, like this magnitude versus identity question? Can we see a change in order? And then length, and by length I mean um, how big is our span of things that we can make use of, right? We, we talked about that we can only use a limited number of color, but we can uh, use a very broad spectrum of positions. So we can like have a table with many hundred rows, for example, um, and that, that, that works well. Okay, so let's review those, um, uh, let's review those individual channels. Position, as I already mentioned, is the strongest visual variable, and it's suitable for all data types. What are the problems associated with it? Well, sometimes it's not available. So for example, if you want to plot information on top of a map, you can't really choose your position because your position is given by the location, for example, of a city. Um, and it can lead to cluttering. So for example, if I have densely populated areas, um, I have a lot of information in the same place, and then I can't really uh, distinguish between those items. So they are selective. I can clearly uh, tell them apart. They are associative. They support grouping. We can do, of course, quantitative uh, data. They support ordering. And we have a pretty lost, uh, pretty big vocabulary. They have a high length. So a good example here is the scatter plot, of course. Um, here, the scatter plot shows us the um, um, incoming inequality between uh, men and women. So you have men on the x-axis and women on the y-axis. And again, this is like an older New York Times chart, which is broken. So this is like one problem. Older charts um, used flash, and now they're dying. Um, so I'm curious how, whether this is going to happen with D3. Well, we still have to figure here. Um, so we can see that there's only a couple of jobs where women actually make more than men. And I think this was nursing or something like that, if I remember correctly. <coughs> And then there are certain jobs, jobs where women make about 10% less than men. Uh, and then there are certain jobs where women make, women make more than 30% less than men. So this is, um, I think, this is law or something like that. Position, as great as it is, it is not as good in 3D. So for example, if you look at this 3D scatter plot, um, this is sales for over multiple years, uh, and then cost. So we have the, the sales, we have years, and we have cost. And it's really hard to tell apart, like this here, like which of those, uh, like where, where are those points, what are the exact values of those points, right? We have occlusion, like we can't really, for any of, like this yellow point, how many, like is it 25 or is it 15 uh, in terms of sales or is it uh, 25 or 15 in terms of cost? So position in 3D is really weak and you can kind of make this a little bit better by using interactivity by letting people navigate and so on, but still it's not a great visual encoding because of all of these problems. So length and size of items such as like the size of a rectangle, the size of a bubble, the length of a, a bar uh, are uh, good for 1D, okay for 2D, so rectangles for example are harder to perceive than the length of a bar and they're bad for 3D. The volume, we're really bad at judging volumes. Um, um, align bars, as I already mentioned, use position redundantly. So it's easier for us to make a comparison between those two because here we're using position um, than to those two because they're not aligned and so we only have to rely on our perception of the length. Uh, they are selective, they're associative, they're quantitative, they're ordered and we have a pretty high length. So they are generally like a good, uh, good visual variable. So here is an example um, for using 2D size. This is like um, how, again, a New York Times graphic and how to slice Obama's budget. We'll be looking at this a little bit more in more detail um, at some other point. But what you see here is essentially just the major, like the major expenditures um, in the US uh, discretionary spending budget. And so we can see Social Security, or it's actually all spending, not discretionary, uh, Social Security and uh, Health and Human Services here um, are by far the biggest blocks. Um, value, luminance, and saturation, they're okay for quantitative data when you can't really use length and size because they're used in some other way already. Um, you can't really recognize very many shades. Um, they are selective, they are associative, they are somewhat quantitative, but there are problems associated, so it's hard to judge whether this is twice as big as this, for example. They're ordered, and we only have a limited vocabulary of them, so we can do maybe like eight or ten different ones. So here is a good example of a diverging value scale map. Uh, we have like um, 
uh, map. I like to think this is uh, Obama McCain election. Um, and we have this map, and we not only show binary how, who has won that, but we also show by how much for each district in the United States by using this value scale here. And so you can see like, that there are some like, big counties here that are just barely went to Obama, uh, but that many counties, like, especially in the Midwest, went clearly to McCain. Uh, we talk a lot about color and perception lecture, lecture. just uh, think, like, think about it for a minute as a visual variable. It's good for qualitative data as an identity channel. Um, we have a limited number of classes, as I already mentioned. We only can use about seven to ten different colors. It does not work with quantitative data, and we've talked a lot about the different pitfalls with color, so be really careful when you use that. So my rule here is to minimize color use for encoding data, uh, used primarily for brushing to also leverage these pop-out effects that we talked about, that we have like a clear distinction between a background and then one, for example, selected color. They're selective, they're associative, they're not quantitative, they're not ordered, and we have a very limited length because we only have seven or eight um, colors that we can use. So here is a terrible example uh, of a use of color for a quantitative data set. Um, this is estimated fraction of precipitation loss to um, evapotranspiration. Uh, if in this, like how you or how how much um, how much of the precipitation evaporates quickly, um, and this is this very very complicated color scale uh, where you have like different colors have completely different meanings, and it's not necessarily like there is no clear ordering between those colors. So if you're not trained at looking at this color scale, you might actually think that these dark values here, for example, are high, but they're actually pretty low, right? They're lower than the brown values down here. So there is no, there's no clear ordering. Um, experts still tend to like those because they are used to seeing those, but you have to really train uh, to understand such a color map. So it's not easy to learn. And I would argue there's better ways of doing that. And I think I already showed this particular chart. This is a good example of the use of color, where I simply want to highlight one aspect. Um, for example, here, this is the uh, football, uh, Peyton Manning's pass record. Um, and, and the distinction that they use for color here is just like, who are the active players? They want to emphasize those, because they could, in theory at least, still beat Peyton Manning's record versus everybody in gray is already retired. So this is like a great example of the use of color because it highlights one important point um, and it clearly pops out. So shape is great to recognize many classes, but unfortunately we have neither grouping uh, nor ordering. Um, so they are selective, but uh, the associative power is very limited. Uh, they are not quantitative, they are not ordered, um, but we have a gigantic length. And so, Clearly there is no ordering between, for example, these three symbols here. Um, but you probably recognize all of those symbols. So we have very, very many different symbols that we can use, that we can leverage. Um, that is like great, but you also have to learn them, right? And, the, and again, the, there is no ordering and it's hard to encode anything but, but identity to them. People have actually tried to use that uh, to encode quantitative data. So this is a, a, an influential paper from like a very early, I would say, visualization paper. Um, and the theory behind the paper is that we as humans are really, really well trained to, um, to see faces, right? We can see very subtle changes in faces. So for example, these two faces here are only subtly different, but we, see, we can very easily make out that difference. Um, and we wouldn't be quite as good if it were not some like facial Live. And so the idea of this person, Chernoff, who was a statistician at Harvard, was to use facial parameters to map the quantitative data. So he would take five or six different numerical values and then map them at, um, to the distance between the eye, the length of the nose, the curvature of the mouth, the curvature of the face, and so on. And so this was the idea behind that. Who thinks it works? It is really, really hard to see that. Like, it's clear for us that there's differences, but we cannot translate it back to the quantities that we want to represent, right? Like the eye size here is pretty big, 
okay, if we can make an explicit effort of thinking about that, but what other factors play a role in that particular phase is just important for us to see. So there is a link to a detailed critique on these general faces, uh, because for, for a period in, in visualization they, they, they wouldn't go away, but now they have gone away. Uh, there are many, many more channels, right? There is this website here that shows us 45 different ways to communicate two quantities. So we could have, like, one thing that we didn't mention are, are writing or, num num uh, or like just numerals, like either Roman or Arabic numbers. Um, here we have these squares, repeated icons, uh, bars, line graphs, splice bars, and so on. So there's many, many more here, and some of them are really weird, like uh, icon surfaces, volumes, special metaphors, and so on. So you can take a look. This is more like uh, illustrative. This is actually an interesting one. This is Fat Fonts. Uh, Fat Fonts tries to like mix um, the, the numerical representation with the appearance. So like a seven here is appears darker than a three. Um, I think I have an example sometime later in the lecture, um, in another lecture. So I'll go a little bit more into those fat funds. So why are those quantitative channels actually different? So it turns out there is um, like there is like some um, theory behind that. So first, um, Stevens has studied um, the relationship between the physical intensity of the stimulus to the perceived sensation, and so he has found that the only, um, the only um, stimulation where the stimulation matches to the actual physical, physical intensity, where we have a linear relationship between those, is length. And that's why length and position are these great visual variables. For example, for saturation, there is like lower physical intensity, but we, uh, we perceive it too high. Electric shock is really a terrible variable to encode data. So, like, small variations in electric shock are highly strongly perceived. So, no, never use electric shock to encode data. <laughs> um, area, we tend to underestimate areas. Uh, we tend to underestimate brightness and we tend to underestimate depth. Uh, and so, this is like Stephen's psychophysical power law. Um, this is like the important background why, why we have this ranking of visual variables. So, this is the original one. Uh, we also tend to, uh, like this is the one adapted by Tamara Manson for everything that is related uh, to visualization except for electric shock, that's just because it's so much fun. Uh, and then here we have things like heaviness, so we tend to overestimate heaviness, we tend to overestimate taste, and then we tend to underestimate loudness and smell, for example. Okay, I'm going to do another experiment. How much longer is speed in A? Twice. Twice. Everybody get it right. How much longer is speed in A? Four. Three or four, I heard mostly four. Everybody got it right. How much steeper is A than B? I hear like many different things. Six, three, the answer is about four times. So we can see that way less consensus on how much steeper A than B is. How much larger is B than A? Twice. Three, four, twice, six, uh, again a lot of variation, it's about five times as big. How much bigger is B than A? Three, four, two times, with the caveat, by diameter. Um, so, if you look at the bubble, uh, what do you mean? Do you mean diameter or do you mean area? And that's a common problem. You should always, if you do that, you should always use area. You should never use diameter. Uh, because we perceive the area here. So this is twice the diameter, but means four times the area. How much larger is this now based on area, B than A? Twice. One and a half, it's three times. How much darker is B than A? <laughs> Twice as dark. How much darker is B than A? Five, four, about three times. So 
the, the point of this is really to demonstrate to you, like empirically, that everybody got position rights, right? Nobody, there was like, everybody said twice, you know, in like the same second, every time, everybody said four times the same second when I used position. Uh, but then everything else was very, very varied. Um, and there's this interesting game here that, uh, you can another flash problem. Uh, so here, this is this eyeballing game that kind of like tells us a little bit about our weakness of our perceptual system for those things. So I'm trying to like make this a parallelogram and oh, I'm actually quite wrong here again. Like I'm trying to find the midpoint of this line segment. This was good. I'm trying to bisect the angle. Well, not very good. Like you can see that there are certain things that we're good at, that other things like mark the point that is equidistant from all of the edges. This is pretty good. Here, the center of the circle. So you can play around with this and find, like, again, all of these angle judgments. So this one was pretty good, but all of these angle judgments are are hard for us. The point of convergence. Hi. Hi. Okay. So, yeah, just this you can play with this. Um, it's quite interesting to see what we're good at and what not. So these, these things that don't happen in an isolated uh, setting, there are many other factors that affect accuracy of perception. Uh, things like alignment, distractors, the distance, and then Hamann scales. Um, so here, for example, we are using unaligned bar charts, which is harder to judge for us than framed unaligned bar charts. So here we have the bar chart A and the bar chart B, um, and we can simply make these comparisons in a like in a better way because we can also judge the proportions here between those ratios uh, instead of just judging the length. And then if we have uh, unframed but aligned, we, this is very easy for us to see that A is bigger than B. And then here we have a couple of distractors. So this here is harder to compare than this or this or this. Like here this is actually, like these are actually of a different height but I even knowing that it is hard for me to say which of those is the bigger one, right? Just because of the distance. So all of these things affect accuracy. Um, there's many other factors. And then we're getting to this paper now. Uh, this is the original study by Cleveland McGill uh, from 1984. And they studied these things in, in these kind of like um, ecologically valid environments. Um, and so they, they studied like which of these uh, marks uh, is easiest to perceive. And so this is not a replication study. Who has read the paper? Everybody should raise their hands if it's mandatory. <laughs> Who wants to give a summary? No brave souls. <laughs> Jen. Yes, okay, so let's, let's rethink this a little bit. So they used Mechanical Turk to do a perceptual study like this. Who's ever heard of Mechanical Turk? A few people. Has anybody ever done any of these human intelligence tasks? Nobody has ever worked in for Mechanical Turk? Has anybody ever run like a study like this? Or any other perceptual study? Okay, so what was the goal of this paper? What did they try to do? Okay, yes. Uh, in, in place of a user study, can you be a little bit more specific? Um, because, because mechanical Turk is much cheaper than paying um, participants in user study. Yes. Price is one argument, so like, um, okay, let's just recap, like in case anybody hasn't read the paper. So Mechanical Turk is this Amazon platform where you can give simple human intelligence tasks to a big group of people and you pay them using micropayments. So for example, for every task that you complete, you get like five or 10 or 20 cents. Um, and you can actually leverage that for many different things. So it's been widely leveraged to do, uh, to create labeled data sets for computer vision, for example. Like ask people to 
see, uh, to answer what, is, what do you see in this picture, and then they would say birds, leaves, what is the color of the picture, and so on. All of these things can be like, done in these human intelligence tasks. And these guys, and this has been used also for, for studies, right, to, to get some kind of like surveys in uh, to study human behavior. And these guys here did a rigorous evaluation of the suitability of the use of mechanical Turk for perceptual studies um, targeted at visualization. Okay, and so what were the experiments that they ran? So, what did it compare? Yes, exactly. So they, they did like one study where they replicated the Cleveland McGill study and then compared those rectangles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and they, they did most of these elements, but they also studied things that were not really popular. When Cleveland McGill did this back in the 80s, they didn't really like use too many bubble charts and they didn't use tree maps. So they added those two techniques. Um, and what did they find? You're welcome to look at the paper while you're giving an answer. So is it was similar to the radio simulations and then they found that uh, position was the best and angles were and the angles were not as good as areas. Yes. That's what they found. So they, they replicated the study. Um, they had very similar results. And so therefore they kind of like confirmed, on the one hand, that what Cleveland McGill studied in the 80s is in fact correct, uh, but they also confirmed that Amazon Mechanical Turk is a suitable tool to do these kinds of studies, right? Um, and they did like a much larger experiment than Cleveland McGill did. So why is there actually a concern about uh, running this on, like, on Mechanical Turk versus in a lab study? What is the big difference? The accuracy of the data you collect. Exactly. And what influences the accuracy? So, like, you're paying all these people to do it, and if they're just doing it for money, then they may not give it full attention. Yes. Like, I can much better control for whether people are serious when they're in a lab setting. They might be intimidated by, like, doing completely stupid things if there is, like, supervisor there. So this is something that you have to control for. What else is a problem? Uh, technical equipment, like displays for the computer. Yes, exactly. So color is very tricky. You see this very often when I show you something on the screen, like you can't properly see it because the color resolution of a projector like this isn't quite as good as my uh, MacBook uh, screen here. So we have like a, this big variation um, in, uh, in display technology, in resolution, in angle, in lighting conditions, in distance to the screen, in angle of the per person to the screen. And I can also control for all of these variables very, very exactly in a laboratory study. And I can't really do that um, on a mechanical Turk setting. And so what did they find? Was that a problem? So they, they showed that it's for these tasks where it's about position and, and, and uh, area and so on, it, it was evidently not a problem, right? Because there's those that don't depend too much um, the color. So what, what is the benefit of running this on uh, Mechanical Turk compared to uh, a lab study? Like when you run an experiment like that... You can get more quantity yes. in, this, uh, in the same time. Yes. Okay. You can get like more people to do that. Other benefits of running this on Mechanical Turk? Faster. Less cost. Cost? Less faster? Yeah. Less cost? Exactly. You wouldn't believe how well studied college undergraduates are and how, how badly studied, for example, like senior citizens are. Uh, we tend to like, have a strong bias towards convenient samples um, because it's just so much easier to simply recruit six of your lab mates for a study than it is to go out and try to like, replicate the population number. Of course, Amazon Mechanical Turk comes with caveats too, uh, but you can actually adjust the parameters of the demographics of the people that you want to find so that you can kind of sample the population. So we have a little bit more, this is called like ecological validity, right? 
Um, we have a little bit more ecological validity with respect to our population, potentially. What, there's another aspect of ecological validity that we already touched upon. That would be the screen. Yeah, it's like the environment. Like people don't look at these visualizations in a controlled lab environment, right? Uh, they look at those visualizations um, in, on their various displays. So maybe any like recommendations that we make for practical visualization designs should take into account these variations. And so we shouldn't say, um, yes, there is a just not noticeable difference between those gray shades in optimal viewing conditions. We should say, we need to take care of the just noticeable, noticeable difference for at least 98% of the population out there, right? And we can get these kinds of factors um, to work uh, better with Amazon Mechanical Turk than we can in any way with any of these um, more, like, more controlled lab studies. Okay, so um, what other studies did they run? What's that? The amount that they paid the turks. They yes, so they, they did some kind of like they always had two goals, right? They had this meta goal of evaluating um, how mechanical turk works. So what did they find? Find for payment. Like how much? Well, no. What what's their inside about a payment? Oh, that it will get the task done faster, but not better. Yes. So that's a very important insight. Like if you need to get something done fast, you have to pay more, but it's not necessary that you actually uh, change, like that, that you get worse results if you're cheap. Um, so that was an interesting point. What other thing is very important for accuracy? Qualifying examples to make sure that they're accurate. Exactly. So you have to have these qualifying examples because you will have some people that simply click through this without thinking and you can disqualify them if you have any of those qualifying examples. And then in modern mechanical turf studies we also run things like color blindness, uh, pre-tests and so on. So all of these things are, are important. Okay, so um, they also like the second thing that they studied was this um, grid alpha um, aspect. So what, what was the idea here? They were trying to find out uh, how and the grid lines, so by adjusting the alpha values, so what alpha values were, so as to uh, distinguish between the grid lines. And yes, background. exactly. So they were trying to find out um, what is a good alpha value, like uh, how, how prominent do those grid lines have to be uh, under various conditions. And they replicated a, a fairly recent laboratory study, like one year before um, they did this study. Um, and again, they kind of replicated their results, but they had a little bit more variation, I would say. Um, and this is again, why is this not surprising that they had more variation here? Because it depends on the system. Yes. Exactly. So uh, size and so on is going to be more faithfully represented across multiple screens, whereas we have these systematic differences between operating systems even uh, in terms of how the alpha appears on different screens um, and so on. So there was a little bit more variation, but they concluded that you could still, um, could still use this data in a, like, basically they saw the same trends, but they had some, like, a little bit more variation in that. Okay, so um, who, like, any comments about this paper? Did you find this a good paper? Do you, anybody? Yeah, I mean it was, it seems kind of, I mean like these kind of crowdsourcing things, they're so efficient now and so common, but it'd be easy just to kind of, kind of overlook the negative effects that they could have on our studies. Yeah, so this is, crowdsourcing has been like, this is kind of the early phase, right? This is seven years ago. Uh, and ever since, crowdsourcing has been increasingly popular to, to study uh, perception in many different ways. So if you go to like a typical visualization conference nowadays, you would find like at least 20% of the paper use some kind of crowdsourcing. And, and the advantages are, of course, that it's easy to deploy, it's cheap, you get a lot of results, you can do runs 
quickly and these systems are increasingly powerful. So they did actually two different things here. They gave just like image stimuli, but they also had an interactive stimuli for the second experiment, right? And so they had a little bit more control. Uh, and so you can also um, use this to evaluate interactive techniques. Okay, let me see if there's anything else that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, so this is a figure from their paper. Um, you can see that essentially the Cleveland McGill results, they, they were very like similar to what they um, had. Um, the ordering stays exactly the same. They have a little bit more variation in these error rates, these 95% confidence intervals um, for the log errors. Um, and so here is like this, this um, ranking of these visual variables uh, for these quantitative ordinal nominal um, data sets by de like an other ranking by uh, decreasing suitability. And this is just to emphasize again that position here is consistently at the top. Um, yeah, I think we've talked plenty about this. Um, so now I kind of like the one thing that I, the last thing that I wanted to talk about today is the separability of attributes. So I kind of alluded to that at the beginning, um, that we have multiple visual variables. So we can, for example, combine position with you, and these are fully separable. These are kind of like independent of each other to some degree. Um, then I can add size, uh, but I'm starting to notice some interference, right? The color of this little bubble is not as obviously perceivable as the color of this big bubble. And obviously, if I went into the extremes and make this smaller and smaller, uh, the hue um, is going to be harder to, and also the position is going to be harder to spot. Um, if I start to modify width and height, then I, I have um, quite significant interference. So these are not independent uh, anymore. And then if I, for example, took the color channel and encoded red, green, and blue separately as three data values, we have major interference. So this is like, um, we cannot do that. We have these different aspects. Um, like of a color, and, and like they are, this, this represents all of the data conceptually, but it's simply not, we cannot separate them in our heads. We would have to really think about this, um, and then this is not the point of visualization, obviously. Okay, so this concludes the lecture on uh, marks and channels, and then I'll see you guys again on Tuesday for a deep dive into D3. Uh, can you? Yeah, I can. Okay, so just real quick, you guys are using Slack a lot for your homeworks, and that's great. You want to be very careful with posting too much code. There's a few examples where we have to delete the message. So I know it's just a screenshot of your constructor. The moment you put it up there, someone else can use it. It's not your fault, but then it's definitely plagiarism. So be careful with that. And the other thing is, for those of you who have been using Slack, you probably noticed that the messages get all mixed up if two people are asking at the same time. So the way we're going to do that is, once you ask a message, all of the answers and discussion is going to go into a thread. And if you want to answer, just put, there's a little message bubble, and you say start thread, so that only, the only thing we're going to see is the questions on the main channel, and all the discussions are in threads. So just try to remember to do that to be a little more organized. Okay, great. So I'll see you guys Tuesday.